my name is James Haney, and you are presumably here for my presentation. It's the little things building verisimilitude into your soundscape. Welcome. Uh, presumably, uh, the video is working, uh, and we have 50 minutes to get through this, so I'm just going to get going. We were all sternly warned by the con not to self deprecate, and I'm not going to do that, but I want to disclose up front that this is my first time attending a general SF con, much less presenting at one, much less presenting virtually during a pandemic uh, without any audience to tell me when I'm uh, to react to me. I am very nervous about making this all work correctly. Uh, I'm praying to the patron saints of tech that my demos don't break, uh, but I'm kind of new here, so if anything goes wrong, and I don't seem to have noticed, please feel free to get my attention and I'll try to address it. My understanding is that none of you are here in the WebEx where I'm talking. Uh, but we can still get together on the Discord in channel Toast A. Uh, I am monitoring that. My presentation in practice runs ran timed out at about 50, 45 minutes, and we're done at 50. So I will take your questions and comments at the end, but I will try and monitor the chat for technical problems and other issues, and you know, just feel free to put whatever you want in there as well. Now, here's who I am and why I think I'm worth listening to. No self-deprecation here. Uh, I am the showrunner of Starship Excelsior, an audio drama that has been in continuous production since 2007. There are audio dramas on Apple Podcasts that have been lo around longer than that, but not a whole lot. Like many audio dramas created around that time in the pre Welcome to Night Vale days, we are a fan audio drama. Ours is particularly set in the Star Trek universe. We drew inspiration from fan audios produced by Darker Projects and Pennant Productions, uh, both of which have since moved on to original work and who doesn't occasionally love an episode of Seminar. Uh, and when the story Starship Excelsior came to tell is told, we'll probably do the same. We have an amateur, all-volunteer cast scattered across the world from South Korea to England. Everyone records on their own time in their own home studios. And by home studios, I mostly mean in the closet with a comforter on your head. We have a great technical team led by Jim Smagata, technical director of Theatre Arendelle at the University of Toronto for 25 years. I, on the other hand, knew absolutely nothing when we started out. In retrospect, I had no business starting an audio drama. Lucky for me, Jim and several other people stepped in and saved my show. This talk is aimed at someone who may have recently started or is thinking about starting an audio drama of her own, or who would like to become a mixer for an existing show. Lord knows we have lots of people in our community, but not nearly enough mixers. So God bless you if that's you. This is someone who may not have a Jim Smagata to save her, uh, like he saved me. Someone who knows enough about multi-track editing to put lines and sound effects into the right places, who can follow a script to the letter, but who's still trying to figure out why the result Sounds like hot garbage instead of audio theater. This talk won't turn you into Jim Smagata or Misha Stanton. I can't turn you into what I'm still aspiring to be, but it'll hopefully get you on your feet. In other words, this talk is aimed at me when I was making the first and second seasons of my show before I learned from the pros in my life. And I can only hope this recording falls through a wormhole or something and lands in young Jamie's lap. Experienced audio drama producers might glean one or two things from this talk if you've been making a show for a few years, but a lot of it is really pretty basic. On the other hand, people who have only enjoyed audio drama as listeners may be a little bit as C when I jump uh, right into the editor. I'm going to try and make this as accessible to everyone as I can, but that's the problem with skills talks at a convention, right? Everyone in the room comes in with a different background, and it's hard to make it super useful to everyone. I'm a programmer during the day, and we have the same problem at software conferences. So if you decide midway through this talk that this isn't the right fit for you, it's not the right level for your interest, go ahead and drop out. I will not be hurt. I apparently can't even tell because uh, I, you're invisible to me in this WebEx environment. Um, but the rest of you who are staying with us are maybe asking yourselves, but how did young Jamie eventually learn to make scenes that sounded like audio theater instead of hot garbage? If I could answer in one word, that word is unsurprising because it's in the title of the talk. It's verisimilitude. If I had made a PowerPoint for this talk, I would flash that right up on top of the screen right now, but instead I made tech demos. Uh, but imagine I did make a PowerPoint. Verisimilitude is shining up in big gold letters right now. Verisimilitude just means likeness to truth. And it's one of the key things that makes it possible to lose yourself in any fiction, any fiction. In audio specifically, there are a lot of ingredients necessary for verisimilitude that are outside the scope of this talk. Uh, you need a good writer who tells a story that is true, starring characters who are true, Speaking dialogue that is also true to life. This is fundamental to all fiction, and this talk will not help you with it at all. In performance fiction, you also need actors who can tell the truth about their characters. In audio, then, you have to have mixers who take those isolated performances and set them into a world. And that's where this talk comes in. The actors have to make their characters real, but your job as the mixer is to make the entire world real, which is a slightly bigger problem. At first, you think, 
or at least I thought <laughs> back in 2008, uh, that building a world is pretty easy. You have a scene with two people on a beach, you put their lines together, you add some waves, you're done. Two people in a living room, don't even need the waves. Two voices, done. I was very wrong, really wrong. The world we live in is a lot richer than that. You may not notice everything in your living room, especially if you're having a meaningful conversation there that absorbs all your attention, like is usually happening in a dramatic audio production, but it's all still there in your living room and your ear will notice if it's not, if it's missing. So that's why the first part of verisimilitude that I am going to talk about tonight is environment. In this part of the talk, I'm going to discuss three aspects of environment building, of environment building, ambience, reverb, and noise reduction, or ambience if you are, depending on your spell checker. Not going to settle that. Every space has sound. Great audio drama will often take a script to all kinds of exciting places with sounds you can instantly hear in your mind's ear. Uh, you might go to a lonely cliff face, uh, and I hope you can hear that uh, that lonely cliff face right now with the waves crashing against it. Uh, you might go to a, a fetid sewer or an exotic rainforest. But Every space has sound, uh, not just the really exciting ones. The only space without sound is the Orfield Laboratory Anechoic Chamber in Minneapolis, Minnesota, specially designed to be the quietest place on Earth, so they can test headphones and stuff. It's constructed with three and a half foot thick, carefully shaped fiberglass, and no one is allowed to stay inside the chamber for longer than 45 minutes because many people at that point start to hallucinate because of the silence. So not only does every space have sound, but you actually start to lose your mind if you are not in the presence of sound. Uh, have you ever walked around your house and listened really carefully? Of course, there's a sound in every room. We just talked about that. But more than that, there's probably a different sound in every room. There's that, that gentle sound of moving air in your spacious living room with just a little bit of a hum because the neighbor's air conditioner is just out over the fence outside. Uh, there's the room with your air conditioner, which I haven't had a wall unit air conditioner in years, but just hearing that sound makes me feel cooled off. Uh, and then there's the, uh, you know, there's the basement room where you keep your 1990s floppy disk drives, which is, you know, weird, but hey, it's your house. I'm not going to judge. On our starship, the Starship Excelsior, every important room has its own sound, too. Whether we're in sick bay, oh, I got to stop the disk drives. There's sick bay. Or we're in crew quarters. Or we've uh, headed over to the transporter room. Come on, do it. There you go. Our listeners uh, don't consciously notice this, I think. But when the background ambience is wrong, the scene feels wrong. Listeners feel disoriented, although they can't really may maybe necessarily put their finger on why. When it's right, though, it adds a layer of world building that slips right past your viewers, cerebellum, or whatever the part of your brain is that listens to things. I forgot to look it up before I started this talk. And gets into the deep parts of their brain. When the ninth episode of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which aired in 1979, opened a scene on the bridge of a Vogon ship, I knew instantly where we were. I was not listening in 1979. I'm not quite that old. Um, before anyone opened their mouths. And I didn't even realize that I realized where we were. When I went back and listened to it again, I realized that I recognized the, the sitting immediately, unconsciously, because they had used the exact same sound effect two years earlier in the second episode of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which came out in 77. And uh, the radiophonic people, the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, Clever Sauruses had pulled that uh, old sound effect out of storage. Why? Bear similitude. Remind your listeners where they are by using the same sound effect. They won't thank you for it, but they will love you for it. Also, they probably did it because it was cheaper than making a new Vogon bridge effect, if I'm being honest. But I'm certain, I'm certain that Bear similitude entered into it somewhere. Since ambience is so important, where can you find it? We should talk about that quick. Well, of course, there are many, 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 many royalty-free sound effect uh, libraries available for purchase. Several of the ones I've used here, like the basement disk drives, are from Hollywood Edge Premier Edition Volume 1. These sorts of disks are a good investment if you're able to build up enough of them in one go to have a really broad range of useful sound effects. But you live in modern internet times. Everything is available as a subscription these days, and sound effects, including room ambiences, are no exception. I have had good luck occasionally with sites like audiomicro.com, although there are zillions of other options out there which you can very easily Google around for or Bing around for. But room tone 
is one place where your own recording equipment can actually really shine. You can buy a good solid Tascam handheld recorder for less than an entry level mic, walk around your house, and now you have something that is as good or better than whatever you can pay $250 uh, for Hollywood Edge to record for you. As with so many things in audio, often the very best room noises are composed from a, a variety of different elements that you've pulled together into one file and harmonized together. Here is one that I made for Faraway City on Union 3 in the future, outside Admiral Athos Parker's window. It's about six different library sources layered together. And again, if you're not hearing any of this, please say so in uh, Toast A in the chat. Um, when you're layering but everything that might be making noise in the room uh, or outside the room as in this case and had it in even a quietly ticking clock on a shelf in the background adds uh that feeling of space that sense of their similitude of course the sound in the room isn't quite the end of the story uh walk through your house again and in each room when it is very quiet shout once real loud it's fun listen very carefully then to how the sound reflects back to you first of course you'll notice that in most rooms your voice reverberates quite a bit. Well, not quite a bit, a little bit. Second, you'll notice that it reverberates very differently in a big open mezzanine versus inside of a shower. This doesn't typically make a big difference, uh, to be honest, in audio drama, especially in if you're your setting is a space that's relatively similar to the space for which your rec actor recorded in. But there are times when something is just obviously not right um, because the scene isn't reverbed correctly. Let's take a brief look at this indoor pool scene. Uh, let's open reverb.ses. Okay. Uh, listen to Commander Savick's line and ask yourself whether it sounds like it should sound in this space. And I, I was originally going to play it directly out of Adobe Audition, but I found out Adobe Audition will not link up to my WebEx. Uh, so I have uh, mixed this down into a different file, which I will now play for you, but it's just this thing that is here. Uh, here it is. <laughs> Sixty. Admiral Styles always overestimates his margin of error. That doesn't sound quite right to me. Let's listen to uh, Savick's line in isolation. There it is. Sixty. Admiral Styles always overestimates his margin of error. Savick's voice doesn't fit the space we've set it in. Everyone else's voice in this indoor pool echoes a little bit, not too much, but a little. And Savick's voice is crisp and clean, like she's saying at the soundproof recording studio, which, as a matter of fact, she was. Uh, so let's try and fix that. There are roughly 1 million VST plugins available for managing reverb. Adobe Audition 3.0, which is my preferred audio workstation from before the dark times when Audition became a subscription only product, has four. Uh, I'm going to open up one of them. Each of these uh, four plugins has its own customization settings you can mess around with but most of them offer the same basic tools for reverb and this is true everywhere adobe uh, not uh, audacity has the same fundamental tools for reverb how quickly do you want the different kinds of echoes to hit uh how much should the echoes diminish from the original how absorbent is the room etc cetera, etc cetera. many plugins come then with a bunch of presets to help you get started and it so happens that the lecture hall preset uh in my opinion fits this pool scene pretty nicely so we're going to apply that that adds a reverb to her. And now how she sound? She sounds like this. 60. Admiral Styles always overestimates his margin of error. There. Now, to me, that sounds a lot closer to how the other people in our indoor pool setting sounded. So let's try listening to that clip again with the, the modification we just made. There it is. 60. Admiral Styles always overestimates his margin of error. <laughs> to me, at least. That sounds much better. And it adds up over the course of a whole scene. You can easily end an hour, spend an hour, not end an hour, spend an hour fiddling with the settings uh, in the reverb to get it exactly the way you want it. And frankly, you probably should. Although I did not for this demo, I did about 10 minutes on this. Um, your audience will never notice if you do it right because Savic will just sound like she's at the pool. But if you don't do it right, they will notice that even though they probably won't be able to put a finger at exactly what is wrong with the sound in the scene, just that the world isn't quite drawing them in for some reason. Although most spaces aren't so drastically different from the recording environment that it will be as obvious as this, I, I don't think I've ever actually done an audio drama that, where we had an indoor pool scene. Uh, it is something that you should always be thinking about when building a scene, even if you end up not having to use it in your particular scene, and because you, you should have that reverb tool in your back pocket for those occasions when it is needed. That's one reason why it's very, very important 
that your actors record in as dead of a space as possible. You hear this all the time. It's the first thing anyone tells you when you are after you bought a microphone, like deaden that space. Uh, it's very easy to add reverb to a file. It's very difficult to remove it. Some applications out there do a decent job of it. Nothing built into Audition 3.0 does. Maybe modern Audition does. I don't know. I'm not never subscribing. Uh, but I've had a couple of good experiences, and I've heard a lot of really good things about Isotopes uh, deverbing software. The best thing to do, however, is always, always for an actor to just record with as little reverb as possible, so post production can add the appropriate amount as needed when needed. In an amateur worldwide production, getting this to happen is not very easy, and you will have to spend a lot of time advising your actors to please put a comforter on your heads. Yes, even though it will make you very hot after 15 minutes, but it will pay dividends in the in, in the long run. Actors in an amateur worldwide production bring other environmental challenges. Namely, they all have their own individual room noise, unique as any snowflake. I am sure that the people who run synchronous audio dramas recorded on professional equipment in the same room at the same time occasionally also have to deal with noise reduction. But when you've got amateurs recording in a hundred different spaces, noise reduction becomes a way of life. The noise reduction plugin will be your brother. Let's take a quick listen. Open noise.ses according to my script. This is a scene we made way back in season two in 2009-2010. My baby is blowing her nose noise in the crib nose in the crib behind me. She's going back down. All right. If I have to get my baby up and rock her back to sleep, I will do that. I have grabbed the original audio of the raw recordings of this scene from 2009 from the olden days back before our actors all upgraded their equipment and I removed the background ambience all to make this issue really obvious over the internet video stream. But trust me, if you heard it direct from the MP3 file, you wouldn't need any tricks to have it emphasized. Uh, let's play ZZ1 Noisy. Just listen to the background. You're early, Mr. Lorak. Yes. Why don't you have a... You look like hell. Trouble sleeping? With all due respect, sir, you don't look so good yourself. I plead the seventh guarantee. You heard? I did. Have the services been scheduled yet? Oof. Individually, the room noise in each of those files is pretty mild and not something the actor will necessarily even notice. I've heard a lot worse. Taken together, though, the conflicting room noises emphasize one another and make the problem really obvious. The illusion that these two actors inhabit the same room much less a shared fictional universe, is shattered. Fortunately, we have a simple solution available to us. Eliminate the noise. Again, there are many plugins and pieces of software out there that are devoted to noise reduction. And again, they all, as far as I can tell, pretty much work the same way. As before, I'm going to show you Audition. It's an old-fashioned way of reducing noise, but it is an instructive one. So, And then I'll show you one of the modern, fancy modern tools. So we open up Lorox line again. Uh, and let's actually listen to this line real quick. It's dirty. With all due respect, sir, you don't look so good yourself. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, okay. So we need to get rid of that fuzz. To do that, the first thing we need to do is teach Audition what the fuzz we want to eliminate actually sounds like. We do that by... <laughs> yes, Kai, I will show you the baby at the end of this if she wakes up. Otherwise, I may have to sort of bring my, my camera over and point it at her. Um, in the meantime... So we got to take a fingerprint of uh, of the sound that we want to eliminate. We do that by highlighting an area of the file that is just pure noise with nothing valuable or disruptive in it, like dialogue or page rustles. And I like this bit. There's really nothing in it. There's not even this little, like, there's this hump here. I don't know what that is. I don't want to deal with it. So uh, we can see this really clearly in the spectral frequency display, but it's also really quite clear in the waveform display. There's nothing going on here. So uh, just background noise. So we're going to go under uh, effects, restoration, noise reduction, and we're going to tell it capture profile. And the, this is the profile that is captured. Uh, I had already captured it earlier. Uh, and then we're going to close it. So now we have this audio fingerprint. Uh, and when we close the noise reduction window, we can uh, then highlight the entire file or the whole file that we are part of the file that we are interested in. Uh oh. Yep. All right. It's this bit. And we're going to reopen this, and we're going to run. And now we're going to run this uh, this over the top of. Uh, this section of, of dialogue. Uh, there is a fairly spirited debate within the Excelsior staff, uh, friendly, but but spirited occasionally, about how aggressive you should be about this. Jim likes to go down about 50%. Uh, uh, he only wants to reduce about half of it because uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Adobe defaults to uh, reducing 100% of the noise that you give it and reducing it by 40 decibels. I'm right now a little bit sort of in the middle. 
Uh, the reason you don't want to be too aggressive is because uh, noise reduction will, will degrade the quality of the underlying sound, the sound you actually care about, especially if it's really aggressive. Um, it will eliminate interesting frequencies of your active performances, and sometimes it will really mess up their R's and S's and some other consonants and letters. Uh, it, it, it can be bad. On the other hand, if you don't reduce it by enough, uh, then it will still be audible. So a lot, of, a big part of the question is um, how how loud is your background ambience and how much uh, can you hide underneath that background ambience? Um, uh, and actually, you can hide quite a bit beneath your background ambience. Uh, so uh, we've run the, the fingerprint and boom, that noise is just gone. How does that sound now? Let's try it out on the uh, Lorac clean file. With all due respect, sir, you don't look so good yourself. There's still that undesirable reverb there. We can't fix that here. But the hum of Lorac's room, room noise is gone. Now let's try automated noise reduction. We will pop open Isotope RX7 here, and I've already loaded up uh, Dovan's lines into this editor. We will just hit, yep, that's right. We'll hit voice denoise. Like Audition, RX7 has the ability to learn a specific audio fingerprint, and you just click that learn button and it goes. Uh, and I find that is generally better than what I'm about to show you, but our, RX7 has a very, very good ad uh, adaptive mode that uh, better, certainly way better than anything Audition has. Uh, and it will just decide for you what the noise is that it wants to eliminate and we'll hit the render button and it will erase that noise. Boom. Why is a complete erasure as Audition did, but pretty strong. Uh, let's play that over here. You're early, Mr. Lorak. Why don't you have a you look like hell. Not bad, not bad. So we will close that up and we'll go back to the original multi-track editor of the scene and we'll listen to the now cleaned up version of it. You're early, Mr. Lorak. Why don't you have a... You look like hell. Trouble sleeping? With all due respect, sir, you don't look so good yourself. I plead the seventh guarantee. You heard? I did. Have the services been scheduled yet? That is a big improvement. True, it is not perfect. Noise reduction is an imperfect tool, but the disruption we still have is quiet enough that we really can probably cover all that up with a decent background ambience. One more reason to include background ambience in your scenes, as if you needed one, we haven't added anything to verisimilitude by cleaning up these lines, but we've removed a big obstacle and we've made verisimilitude possible again. We've also made ourselves super jealous of the people who just get together in one room and record together in really good studios on really nice mics. Incidentally, if you're ever in a really bad pinch and you can't do effective noise reduction for some reason, maybe when you do noise reduction, it degrades the quality of the, the voice too much and you can't get recuts for some reason. Maybe the actor is out of the country or something. This has happened to me. Audio production is hard. Um, one terrible trick that can salvage a scene is to lean into the noise you can't get rid of. Instead of eliminating it, you can extend this noise to fill up the whole scene or gently fade it in and out of particular parts of your scene. And then the noise just becomes part of your background ambience. It's still bad, but it's survivable. Uh, so that's it's a way out. That's the environment. We've talked about now how to create a believable room using ambience how to fit your actors' voices and even your own sound effects into that room using reverb, and how to keep your cast real-life room noise from ruining it all using noise reduction. You're the one using noise reduction, not your, not your cast. Uh, the next big piece of verisimilitude, and maybe, maybe the biggest to my mind, is what I've decided to call for the purposes of this talk, blocking. In this segment, I'm going to talk about going beyond the script to identify sound effects. I'm going to talk about identifying character placements and using stereo panning to bring those placements to life. And finally, I'm going to talk about the rarely needed but underappreciated art of the transition, which combines many of the things we'll have talked about so far. So your showrunner hands you a script and some sound files and says, make this happen. That's my me voice. Make this happen. The script will generally tell you where the scene is set, who says what, and what sound effects to add in. If you have a good writing and direction team, the script will already be pretty rich in detail about how to build the world of the scene. But the writer is sitting there at his keyboard trying to hold this whole world, which for him is, remember, completely imaginary and very much in flux until that script is completely done, all in his head at once. He can't hear it the way you can, banging there at your keyboard, putting the sounds in place. As you build out your scene, put yourself into the world and try to figure out what's still missing. What sounds did the writer overlook? Then add it in. These are, as you would surmise from the title of the talk, usually little things. 
take this very short scene. Well, it's not that short. It's 45 seconds. Take this short scene fragment set in the cockpit of a starfighter. Ah, oh, good. I'd better talk to him. Opening hailing frequencies. And here. Take my phaser. You think I need one? I believe you just said you were inside a volcano with the bringer. You have a good point, Major. <laughs> Thanks. Excelsior here. There we go. Now, uh, Colin Heyman's script uh, for this episode, it was, uh, listen, was what the title of the episode was called. I'm not telling you to listen, although it'd be great if you listened. Uh, the script called for a cockpit background audience. Uh, it called for a hailing frequencies open computer boop. And for the Major to turn on his phaser as he handed it to Captain Dovan. That's all there in this clip you just heard. But scene producer, uh, scene post producer Jesse Farquharson went beyond the script since he knew from the wider context of the episode, having read the whole thing, he knew this fighter was on combat air patrol. So he added a persistent alarm in the background. Uh, right before pressing hailing frequencies open, he added a couple little button presses since hailing frequencies wouldn't just open out of nowhere. Now we can kind of hear the major pressing the buttons that open hailing frequencies. And most cleverly, I really like this, Jesse added a little call waiting beep that plays in the background while we wait for the Excelsior to answer the hail because it takes like 30 seconds or something between him saying hailing frequencies open and the Excelsior picking up the phone. Um, I never would have thought of that, but Jesse did. All Jesse's changes enhanced the scene and made it seem a little bit more real. I can point to a hundred times this has happened over the years. There was the time way back in the first season when Jim took a combat scene in a planet's atmosphere, which was pretty pretty flat the way I wrote it. And he added jet engine noises so the listener could hear the maneuvers of all three ships and hear how quickly the bad guys were closing in on our heroes. My script was completely honored, but it got a whole new dimension from Jim adding this extra thing in. And then there was a time in our most recent episode when our heroes were in a huge docking bay. So mixer Alexandra Whitley added a shuttle passing low directly over the heads in the middle of one of their lines. Not enough to disrupt the dialogue, you could still hear everything, but enough to make me think of all the times I've been standing outside talking to a friend when an airplane flies overhead and drowns out one of my words. It felt very real. When you hear these moments as a listener, they seem so natural and obvious and true that it doesn't even cross your mind to think about them. It certainly doesn't occur to you that someone had to think up each and every one of these details, and that's the whole point. You're not supposed to be thinking about it. You're supposed to be brought, drawn into the world. Now, obviously, different production teams will have different levels of comfort with all this. If your showrunner or director tells you to stick to the script, do what they tell you. They're the boss. But I think Mixer's brains are an incredible resource that it is very foolish to squander. If you go add something unhelpful, don't worry. The boss is i.e. me, will tell you to pull it out. And it does happen. And it's very friendly. But for the most part, thinking beyond the strict directions of the script only makes the scene sound more real. And it reflects well on the whole team. When I'm working on a scene, as a mixer, I always try to think of at least one detail that the writer didn't. And if I actually wrote the scene, I usually try to think of two. Of course, I call this part of the talk blocking, not detailing. And blocking usually means figuring out where people are positioned on a stage. You don't have a stage. But this does not let you off the hook because you have stereo channels, and I say you'd better be using them. Unfortunately, you know, it doesn't have stereo channels in WebEx. Unfortunately, and I only found this out yesterday, uh, WebEx transits all my computer audio in mono, and there's nothing I can do about that. So some of the demos in this segment are going to be a little bit do-it-yourself. To hear the demos, go to starshipexcelsior.com slash ff21. That's starshipexcelsior.com slash ff21. And then when I tell you to click on the links, you can click the link and you can hear the little clip. First, uh, I will play you a scene with no stereo panning. Both channels are the same, so it's equivalent to a mono file, which means I can play it for you over WebEx. As you listen to this, ask yourself, where are these people in the room? Uh, is Hanas talking to Underwood or is she talking to Dovan? When Underwood walks, where is he walking from? Where is he walking to? You may want to put on headphones if you haven't already done that, because we will contrast this with a file prepared for stereo in a minute. And I'll give you one second to put on your headphones uh, while I find the file. Here it is. Will we even consider giving you full access to the Westlake Archive, your disgraceful conduct on... Good Lord! Um, hi, Underwood. Dovan? What in God's name are you doing here? Nice to see you, too. Excuse me, Commander. This call is classified. General Hanas, I'll call you back. Hey, why'd the Voltaire get the new comm badges before the Excelsior? Jealous, Dovan? I'm not saying it doesn't look good on you, Underwood. I'm just saying we were told we'd get them before Captain oh. Kel. Well, that was before the Voltaire accepted this assignment to the Beta Desolation. 
Now, if you've just heard that clip, um, and if you miss it because you were scrambling for headphones, it is still on there. It's under other sounds. It's called uh, File 10, No Panning, Scene 5MO4. Um, but I'll, I'll keep going. You, if you listen to that clip, you can't really give any answers to any of the questions I asked. Underwood is there. Dovan is also there. Panas is right there with him. Underwood is walking from that place to the exact same place in a mono file or in a stereo file, like this one, where both channels are completely identical, there is no position. The listener is stuck standing in the middle of the room and everything happens directly in front of his nose. You can make something sound further away by cutting its volume, uh, but not in any specific direction. Now let's listen to a version where we take advantage of the stereo sound. This time, you will hear that Underwood is on the far left side of the room, and so is General Hanas, who is talking to him. Dovan is very slightly right of center. Underwood crosses the room to meet Dovan, and Underwood ends up then standing just left of center. On the website I directed you to, again, that is starshipexcelsior.com slash ff21, open file 11, panning, and press play. Will we... oh, I don't want you to hear it on mine. There you go. You can listen to it on yours. Man, listen to that. You just watching it go is really weird. Um, suddenly, though, you, you, we know where everyone in the scene is standing. Not only does this help us understand some of the context better, like where Underwood is walking to, but it also makes this world just pop out with another world of reality. It's one more thing you probably don't notice unless someone points it out to you, but your brain notices with or without you. Verisimilitude strikes again. How do we achieve this? I am pleased to say it is very easy to do basic panning, and I will show you. There's probably advanced panning. I do not know it because I am not that smart. Oh, that's self-deprecation. Never mind. Uh, all right, double-click Underwood's line. If you want to make someone sound like they're on the left side of the listener, make the right side quieter. That's it. Any stereo amplification plugin will do this just fine. We'll start with 10 decibels. At least I think any stereo amplification plugin will do this. As far as I can tell, Audacity is mono only, but I only looked at it for like 30 seconds today. Uh, all right, so we're going to do a constant amplification. Uh, we want it to be... 10 decibels to the left, which means we attack the right channel by 10, and the result looks like this. That is a fairly drastic pan, and it's what scene mixer Jesse Farquharson did to Underwood and Hanas at the start of the scene you just heard, when we wanted to show that Underwood was way off to the side. You want to do this pretty sparingly, because you're losing a lot of sound when you do it. You still want people who are listening to your show on the morning commute in a loud car to be able to hear the dialogue without turning up the volume knob. I tend to favor panning people to the left for exactly that reason, because the left side is the driver's side in America, which means the commuting listener will hear it just a little bit better. Of course, you want to give the right side some love occasionally, so your UK audience isn't missing out. Love the UK folks. When I probably only almost listened to this at this time of the night. Uh, when Underwood moves into the center, he's much closer to the center, and there's no need for a drastic pan. Putting him four decibels to the left, which I will now do. I just undid my previous pan much gentler, see. Um, that'll do just fine. That allows Dovan and Underwood to have a conversation with almost no loss of sound, but with a subtle positional signal that your audience is hearing even when they don't realize it. At least I like to think so. Now, what about when a character is talking while moving between position A and position B? That is just a fancy fade. Suppose we want to move Underwood from the far left and have him cross almost the entire room, so he ends up on the middle right. We will just open up whatever plugin we're using for fades. Again, these are very common, simple plugins, and I'm just showing you auditions because it's the one I use. Uh, and we will set the initial position to 10 decibels uh, left, minus 10. And the final position is going to be 6 decibels right, which means, again, we're attacking the right channel the first time, and we're attacking the left channel the second time. Normally, we we'll want to accompany movement like that with footsteps, because otherwise he's just some kind of creepy ghost sliding across the room like a ghost. Uh, so let's go up to the multi-track editor. I've given him some nice wood footsteps. We don't get to use wood in Excelsior very often because uh, it's the future and they don't have wood in the future, I guess. 
Uh, so we will do the, and you have to do the exact same pan when you do this. Otherwise, the footsteps won't sound like they match up with the voice that's moving. We'll go back up uh, and you can go ahead and uh, listen to the results of that on file 12. Underwood crosses the room. That is what this sounds like. But what in God's. You can listen to it yourselves without me playing it for you. It's only three seconds, so I'm going to assume that most of you are finished with it by now. Uh, you can also make panning happen in the multi-track editor. Audacity in particular seems to encourage this. Just twist the knob or dial for panning or whatever your DAW uses to the left or the right. Here I'm panning it way to the left. That's not decibels, it's points. And I don't know what points are, but it's like six to a decibel. I, I don't use the knobs, so I don't know much about the knobs. Now I'm panning it to the right. Uh, you can't do fancy movement stuff with this because it's not a fade. It's just a straight pan that covers the whole track. Uh, but it works really well for stationary tracks, which is mostly what you're doing most of the time. Figuring out where everyone in the scene is positioned and then panning them accordingly is an important responsibility for the mixer, one that a script often won't mention. As always, different shows approach this differently and follow your showrunner's lead. I do not want you to go to your showrunner and say, no, I'm not doing it that way. James told me to do it a different way. I love your showrunner. He's great. She's great. They're great. Uh, but panning is a subtle but powerful tool for establishing dimensionality in your audio drama, and it would be foolish to leave it on the table, in my opinion. As a note, you will generally want to move the characters in the scene rather than the audience viewpoint. You can move the audience viewpoint by panning things around, and it, it's the same thing, you're just moving the audio camera. Uh, but it's pretty disorienting for the listeners. An exception might be when uh, you are following with your audio camera, you're following two characters in an elevator, for example, in a kind of tracking shot. Those can work, but it is, it's is—it's normally just very hard on the listener and doesn't know what's going on at that point. Uh, now, before I move on, I should say there is some new and exciting technology in this space. Uh, binaural recording is a decades old technique where that's not very new, is it? Uh, but in binaural recording, instead of putting one microphone in a room, you put a dummy mannequin head in the room and you stick a microphone on both ears. One represents the left ear and one represents the right ear. And then you record whatever sound you're trying to record. And you've got a left and a right. This can give you a really realistic sense of space. Uh, if you close your eyes and clap right in front of you, not behind you, you know that it's in front of you and not behind you because your ears are miracles. You simply can't do that with stereo panning alone because stereo panning only has two directions. Binaural recording can do that and creates a surprisingly realistic sense of 3D space, even on two channel stereo sound, obviously even better on surround sound. It's hard though to record actors that way, especially for an amateur audio drama. Not everyone has a mannequin head with microphones that can stick out of the ears. Much more recently, much more recently, we have started to see plugins become available that are able to simulate binaural recording. Binaural, I'm never quite sure. I'm going with binaural because I took Latin in high school. Binaural recording with a high degree of realism. The, the plugin I am familiar with is MyBino uh, from the X Audio team at CMAP in France. It is a free plugin. And when Jesse Farquharson played a binaural clip he was working on using this plugin, I swear I heard a Geminar attack ship fly directly over my head. M really realistic. Uh, as a level of verisimilitude, I typically don't even experience in film. I don't have a binaural demo for you tonight because I am still figuring out how to use it myself. As you heard, I'm still trying to figure out how to pronounce it. But I would be remiss not to mention that this is something that's starting to appear in the audio drama podcasting world. I'm starting to see uh, shows advertise that they did this one in binaural. How am I for time? I have 12 minutes. Okay, that's all right. We're about to wind down anyway. Uh, let's talk about transitions a little bit quicker than the other pieces. Transitions are where we take everything we've learned up to now and use it all at once, kind of. Uh, the problem, a character is moving from room A to room B. This is a problem you will definitely have if you, for example, follow a character into an elevator, as I suggested above. Let's open up transition.ses. The simplest thing to do, the, the thing I tried to do uh, when I started recording audio drama, is just put two ambiences right next to each other, then put a door effect right in the middle, straddling them. Uh, here is our Star Trek sliding door sound. Uh, oh, that didn't play because it's muted. There we go. That's our Star Trek sliding door sound, and it's right here in the editor. Uh, and this is how that transition will sound. Skipper, do you have any idea what that thing was? Whatever, that sounds okay, but it doesn't sound great. It's not how doors actually work. In fact, moving from room A to room B, you wouldn't expect this, is a six step process. First, you're in room A, you hear room A's ambient noise and you, your voice has room A's reverb. Second, you open a door in room A. As the door opens, the ambience of room B feeds in off to one side. 
fades in, not fades in. Third, the door is now fully open. Uh, you now hear both ambiences, although room B's is off to the side. Fourth, you cross into room B. Now room B's ambience is centered and room A is off to the side, the other side, the side you just came from. Moreover, your voice has to change to match the reverb of room B. Fifth, you close the door. The door is now behind you, by the way. The ambience of room A fades out as it closes. Six, you are now in room B. You have completed the transition. You hear room B's ambience only and your voice has room B's reverb. Now, you know how to do all this. It sounds like a lot, but you know it all now. Uh, you probably, if you're experienced, you knew it before you came in here. Uh, you can identify an ambience. You can fade it in or out. You can pan things to be on either side of the door. You can move characters through the doorway along with your perspective and adjust the panning accordingly. Both because we are, as I said, running a little bit low on time and doing a transition well takes several minutes of futzing. And because you can't hear my stereo techniques anyway, I'm just going to cheat a bit. And instead of finishing this demo, I'm going to have you play a fairly complicated scene transition from our most recent episode. You'll be able to hear all of the techniques. And based on what we've already covered today, you should be able to duplicate this at home. And in fact, this would be a good challenge to give yourself to make your, sure you've got all this stuff nailed. Uh, you will want to play file 15 complex transition on that website, starshipexcelsior.com slash FF21. And I will give you a minute to do that. Okay, according to this, you all just finished. Um, the oh, there's a question in the the chat. Uh, what is the name of the binaural plugin? Uh, it is my bino m y b i n o from uh, the X Audio team at CMAP, which is a French polytechnic school. Which is why I remember it because it's not something I run into every day. Um, my bino, it's on the internet. You can search it with Bing. Uh, firstly, no, that that's the wrong paragraph. So the last aspect of verisimilitude I wanted to talk about today is directing. It's questionable that this really falls in your lap as a mixer, but if you are also the director, or if you're in touch with the director, these are specific directing tips that will make your work as a mixer easier once the files get to you. Firstly, when you need your actors to be making a nonverbal noise, decide that in advance. Tell them, and then collect a whole lot of it. For example, if a character is running, the actor is going to need to be panting. Oh, there's crying. I better scoop her up. Just a minute, everyone. I'll give you quick talkings, okay? Dan's talk is almost done, all right? Sorry we're in your room in the middle of the night. It's for a good cause. Hey, Bing pays you rewards for using it. Um, where was I? For example, a character's running, the actor's gonna need to be panting, right? That's what you do when you run. A beginning audio drama producer goes through the script and marks each line that the actor gives while running with the instruction running panting in brackets so the actor knows to make sounds of exertion during that line. But the slightly more experienced mixer knows that the character is going to need to keep panting even between those lines. You can ask the actor to just record the whole scene, including the in-between line parts, but it's hard for the actor in isolation to judge how long those panting silences should be because the other actor doesn't know how long other lines, other actors' lines are going to last. So what I personally like to do is I guess how long the scene will actually take in seconds. Then I triple it. Then I ask the actor to record that much panting. That gives our mixers a nice solid block of actor sound to drop in as needed for whatever length is needed. And we'll usually have some options as to which takes we think are fit the best. This also works for uh, crying, works for grunting, uh, it works for the sounds people make while sword fighting, which I had occasion to find out a couple episodes ago, and it just all kinds of sustained nonverbal sounds. Second, when you're recording asynchronously, getting interrupted is really hard. When you're in a room with someone, it's easy enough to act out an interruption because it's just like real life. Someone interrupts you, you stop talking. Um, but it's really much harder to pretend to get interrupted when nobody's actually there. It often comes out sounding wrong, forced, and a little artificial. I used to think that was a, this was a particular challenge for amateur actors, but then I started noticing it in the Hollywood movies after I dealt with it for a while. When people in movies are talking over the phone or a view screen or something, those scenes are usually recorded at different times. So when it's someone on the phone interrupts an actor in a movie, the actor is usually faking that interruption. And it often sounds kind of forced if you're looking for it. Not always. Actors, um, professional actors are very good at their jobs, but 
sometimes it's a little off. What we on Starship Excelsior started doing to deal with this, uh, we like interrupting people. Uh, we write out the whole line that the interrupted character was going to say. Then we put brackets around the part of the line that should be cut off. Here, I'm going to show you how that how that how we do that. Uh, this is episode five V. So uh, the actor records this whole line, uh, but then the mixer cuts it off right where these uh, square brackets start. Then the mixer drags the next line over the end of the lines being interrupted. So they overlap a little, just like would happen in a real world interruption. Let me show you that. This is the actual episode file, so I need to not break it. So here is the line that uh, Dovan was going to say, and here's the part that gets cut off. And here is Admiral Parker talking over him. I'll just play that for you, uh, but not an audition because I can't. We'll play it in this file 16 interrupt. I have here your original personnel file. The one you submitted upon applying to rejoin Starfleet on Stardate 59712. Ooh, you know, Admiral, I was a very young man when I wrote that, and I said Mr. something- Mr. Jovan, it wasn't even three years ago. You were 72 years old. Uh, 71, February birthday. I really like how natural that sounds. There's always that little bit of crosstalk this way, uh, and I, I like crosstalking and interruption. Uh, there's always a moment before the interruptee gives up, and this allows us to represent that moment and be a little flexible with it because we have the entire line to work with. Uh, most of what I've talked about tonight is pretty widespread, uh, but this trick with the interruptions and frankly with the sustained crying cuts are by no means standard to my knowledge. It's just stuff we've been doing on Starship Excelsior because it seems to work very well for us in our world building. Your mileage may vary. This is not everything I think it's important to know to make a great show. In fact, young James, if you are watching this through the wormhole, please, for the love of Pete, look up what a compressor is. You do not, dynamic processing is not good enough. Gary Cobham is compressing your show right before release. God bless him, but he hasn't told you that. And when he takes a leave of absence in season four, it's going to take you months to figure out why the show suddenly sounds super uneven. Wormhole James, look up what a compressor is. But the focus of this talk was verisimilitude, bringing truth to your soundscape, and I think we've given you a nice foundation in that. So to sum up, in this presentation, we have discussed building up environmental verisimilitude using ambience and reverb, and protecting environmental verisimilitude using noise reduction on your actors' maybe not so professional quality lines. We then talked about building verisimilitude through scene blocking, thinking beyond the script, adding unscripted details, positioning the characters, and other sound effects using stereo panning. And we finally did a quick run through of location transitions within a scene, which can involve all those other elements. Lastly, we talked about building up verisimilitude with your actors by recording sustained nonverbal uh, sounds in large flexible chunks. And then we introduced a way of recording interruptions that may feel a little bit more natural than just having your actors cut themselves off. Congratulations, you can now build worlds. It'll take a while to build really good worlds. I am 14 years in, right? Yeah. It's 2021, I started in 2007, 14 years in, and I'm still learning new things every month. We are going to actually try to do our first binaural episode later this year. But you are on your way. The power to build a really compelling audio soundscape is not to be trifled with. There is nothing as immersive as audio theater. I love this format. Even film presents a two-dimensional world in a rectangle in front of you. A well-made audio drama, when you close your eyes, surrounds you and binds the galaxy together. That's the force. Uh, but an audio drama can still take you places, both intimate and epic, that even a billion-dollar Marvel movie still can't do. It is a privilege to be part of your community, and I can't wait to hear what you make next. Uh, I have two minutes for questions, so I, if you have any questions or comments, uh, put them in the Discord. I'll, of course, I'm very anxious. One of you is going to be an audio pro who says, actually, James, you've been doing that all wrong. But better to say it now than let everyone walk out of the room misled. I love to learn. Uh, but uh, in two minutes, I have to log off of the WebEx. However, I am told that we have the Discord for another hour after the WebEx ends, so I'll hang out there for a while if there's any further discussion to be had. Thank you for being a great audience. I really enjoyed reading your comments in the Discord as it ran. I am James Haney of Starship Excelsior. Over to you. Ah, what do we have? What do we have? Oh, we have a sweet uh, discussion of earbuds for binaural recording. This looks like fun. Oh, and I promise I'll show you the baby. And I have one minute in which to do that. So let's try and get my webcam over there. Oh, I don't think it's going to reach. No, it's too dark. I can turn the light on. There she is. She's two. She's a very happy young miss. Okay. Hopefully you saw her. She's a good egg. 
Okay. I only recently figured out what luffs are, and I don't know what luffs I mix them to. I'm sorry, Tal asked the question. I need to actually read you the questions here. Tal asked Q, do you mix things to a certain luffs level? The answer is, I haven't figured out what luffs maps to in terms of the decibel meter. What I try to mix things to is uh, minus one decibels for the overall scene, minus four for the um, for average dialogue, Maybe minus six, depending if it's a loud scene with some loud sound effects, I'll mix the dialogue a little bit lower. Um, and uh, anything below about minus 10 below the, the zero level is definitely background sound. Um, I should know what a luffs is. I've been doing this as I said for 14 years, but uh, it just hasn't come up. So I haven't learned how to convert the negative decibel system to luffs yet. Learn something new every day. Oh, and I have to close the room. I will be in the Discord, and I will see you all throughout the rest of the convention. Cheers. Thank you again.